I think the moon is the next big thing in part because it's, it's huge. It's you know, larger than Africa, almost the size of North and South America combined, and it's got resources that will benefit Earth in terms of energy, in terms of, of uh, metals and minerals that we can bring back. Uh, it's a great place to do science. Uh, a lot of companies make a business out of supporting scientists. Uh, Raytheon, for example, has a great business supporting polar scientists in Antarctica. Uh, they're providing services. So I think with the moon, it's got this dual use of uh, a great place to do a lot of different kinds of science and a great place to uh, start using the solar system's resources for the benefit of Earth. And I think uh, we can show that with the changes going around us in the space business, the cost of launch dropping because of SpaceX, uh, the, the rationale for doing space is always going to be getting better because the cost of doing things in space is going to be rapidly dropping. And if you're the first and you can win the foundational patents for how to do robotic exploration on a commercial basis uh, with low-cost rovers, I think we'll have both a, a patent portfolio and a market position that is unassailable. You need to ignite the private sector to take a really active role in space exploration because that's where the, the unlimited dollars come from. In, in the government side, you are limited to your appropriation. No matter how wonderful your last mission was, your next year's appropriation is not going to change a lot. If you're spectacularly successful, it might go up some. If you've really botched it, it will go down some. Whereas on the private side, if you involve the, the global public and um, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the world have become excited about going to space and what they can do in space remotely via your project, you can double, triple, quadruple the amount of money you can raise uh, for the next mission. For the folks in the world that are interested in the real challenges that are not made up, that are uh, you know, imposed by, by the universe <laughs> and how to overcome them, how to exploit them, I think that's the key for us is, is activating this latent interest around the world in space that has been served to date only by imaginary space proje projects. You can go to a movie or you can buy a, buy a game, but it's all been made up. This is the first chance to offer people, do you want to vote with your dollars for real space exploration that you can take part in? Now, uh, there are some space companies that are succeeding. Uh, SpaceX is a successful company. Uh, Digital Globe and GOI are doing successful uh, reconnaissance satellites. Uh, there are startup companies doing uh, trips to the edge of space for, for wealthy customers. So the whole notion that you can make money in space is now more accepted. In fact, one of our investors, uh, Julian Ranger, was just on CNBC Europe uh, a few days ago, uh, invited by, the B by CNBC uh, to give an explanation of uh, how this kind of an alternative investment works. And uh, now with the success we've had in getting NASA contracts, uh, we can show that you know, our primary government customer likes us, trusts us, and we have a good shot at turning those preliminary contracts into the big one for delivering the water prospecting payload. The rover will be equipped with a drill uh, able to go about uh, two feet and it will drill down uh, through what we believe to be a, a layer of dry soil, maybe three to six inches of dry soil, uh, that because of the occasional sunlight, although the ice has been driven out, uh, and then reach beyond that to, to where the heat pulse never penetrates and get at the ice that we believe to be there. It's been puzzling to me uh, why some polar craters have ice at the bottom, which is a great resource for us, and other polar craters seem to be completely dry. When we go, we will be helping discover uh, why the South Pole is the way it is. To get to the ice and to go to the location that is uh, closest to the dark without actually going into the dark, you have to develop really good maps uh, of the terrain uh, so that you can model ahead of time uh, where the shadows are and where the sunlight is. And also to know ahead of time 
can you see the Earth from where you're exploring? We have to have direct-to-Earth communication. And so we have these dual challenges of, of trying to find the, the sunniest spot closest to the dark that stays sunny the longest period we can, and also making sure that the sun's not, you know, uh, obstructed by a mountain off in the distance or by a boulder that's, that's, that's close by. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting um, challenge to, to orchestrate the right conditions for lighting and the right conditions for communications and uh, design a robot that, that can uh, capture as much power as, it, uh, as possible from the sun uh, while it, it works in this very challenging, uh, very stark terrain at the South Pole. Well, over the longer term, uh, what we can contribute to humanity is the, a great deal of very low-cost energy and a new source of metals and minerals to run the world's economy. Uh, if we can collect helium-3 from the lunar soil and bring it back to Earth, uh, it's non-radioactive, yet it can be the fuel for clean fusion reactors. You know, basically, a shuttle wor worths of helium-3 could power the United States for an entire year with no radioactivity, no worries about nuclear proliferation, uh, and provide people what, what they really need, which is low-cost power. Uh, around the world, that would be such a boon. If, if there's an electrical grid with really cheap, affordable power from really safe, you know, uh, fusion reactors running on, on, on lunar fuel, that would be such an improvement in, in the world's environment and people's living standards. You know, we, we take for granted the ability to, to flip on a switch and have power. There's a lot of the planet that, that doesn't have that. Uh, and if we can create a way to have really low cost, non-polluting fuel for the world, I think that would be a great outcome. Uh, right now, people, when you say space, they think NASA and they think expensive. I hope that after we succeed on the lunar surface, they'll think interesting, challenging, something me or, or my children could personally do, uh, resources. It's a good place to expand our economy. Uh, and it's a way that instead of, you know, um, ripping up a rainforest to get your precious metals, you can go to a lifeless world like the moon where there's no atmosphere, no nothing living, and have uh, ethically superior ways to support our civilization. When the United States was uh, making its westward push, uh, the first wave of settlers pretty much hurried right past Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma. They thought it was a complete wasteland. There was no forest, and how could you live without a forest? There's no way to get your timber, no way to get, get your food. Um, and so they just went on to California and skipped the, uh, the, the Great Plains. People eventually did settle in the Great Plains and discovered it's a wonderful place to grow food, to grow wheat and corn. And over the decades, it became the bread basket of the world. And people discovered that by living there and experiencing it and trying out what made sense on what appeared to be a pretty barren place. I think the moon is going to be very similar to that. It's going to take people going there, engineers, agronomists, uh, businessmen, to figure out what is the moon good for. We think it's good for energy to bring back helium-3. We think it's good for precious metals like uh, mining platinum and bringing it back. But it has other resources as well. It, it has a, a vacuum, a gigantic hard vacuum that on Earth is really expensive to create. Uh, there are a lot of electronic processes where you want to um, deposit uh, atom by atom uh, a substrate and, a, and an active layer on a piece of electronics. And it costs a lot of money to, to make that vacuum and, and be able to manipulate the atoms to go exactly where you want to go. You've got an entire world where you have a, a free vacuum. That's going to open up people's thinking to processes they may not have imagined would be done in a vacuum, but because it's a new tool, uh, inventive minds will find ways to exploit it. Uh, at the poles, for example, they are the coldest places in the solar system. Uh, cryogenic, you know, uh, superconductor style low temperatures. Uh, it costs a lot of money on Earth to get something very, very cold, down to a few degrees Kelvin. Uh, electronics, physics, 
works differently at those extremely low temperatures. Because it's so expensive to get them here, we don't know that much about them. On the moon, you have absolute, almost absolute cold for free. Uh, when you can have your experiments uh, over a period of years in that free cold for life, <laughs> you're going to find out things you don't know here. It's a frontier. We don't really know how it's going to develop. It takes people and, and machines going there to find out what it's good for.